Good morning, Moses Lake Christian Church. My name is Phil Payne, and I'm one of the teaching pastors here on staff, and it is a joy to be with you this morning. Boy, as I look up and look at the calendar this morning, it is Sunday, November the 1st, and that is incredible to me. This year is flying by so fast, isn't it? Uh, it not, not only is it moving fast, but you know, it, it just feels like change has been part of our vocabulary for this entire year, right? Even this week, last week, we're, we're starting to see the weather change, right? The leaves are falling off and, and winter is showing up. We're, we're looking at seasonal change. You know, we're, we've been in the middle of this pandemic that has caused change to happen on every single one of the fronts of our life. I, we, we're, we look at our schools and the way schools are operating have changed. We look at our jobs and, and see some of us are, are working at home or working from a distance and our, our jobs have changed, right? Even church has changed. It seems like not only just a handful of months ago, church seemed pretty normal and we were meeting. And church today is in a, a completely new season where we're looking and adapting and trying to figure out what is the best way for us to continue to meet and deliver the mission and the vision of the church, which hasn't changed, but the mechanism and the delivery of it has. Even that you're watching this on video, a year ago we wouldn't have been doing this, but now this has become very commonplace. With so many changes happening around us, relationships, our ability to travel or not travel, even as the holidays are coming up, we see some changes in front of us. But we're, we're getting ready to walk into a week where the political climate, no matter what happens this next week during the elections, there's going to be change. And, and really, when I, I think about the year 2020 and change, I think of the word disruption. You know, the definition of disruption is a disturbance or problems which interrupt an event, activity, or process. Man, that, that talks about the year 2020 to a T, doesn't it? it, it it's amazing to me to see how much change has impacted our life. But I want to remind you today as we get a chance to jump into God's word together, that there are some things around us, principally God himself, who we can count on as constant and not changing now, I want to remind you today that in the midst of all the changes and challenges we face, that we do have a choice. For some of us, we see life and it's coming at us and it feels like life is out of control. But even in the midst of life coming at us with choices and challenges and changes, we do have the opportunity and the privilege to choose and to respond how that will impact us. Life can come at us or we can come at life. It was Viktor Frankl who said these words. Viktor Frankl, the, the Austrian psychiatrist who was also a Holocaust survivor, who found himself in a concentration camp and going through one of the most difficult seasons of his life, not sure if he was going to live or die. He, he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And he said this, that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. He went on to say, every day, every hour, we are offered the opportunity to make a decision, a decision which determined whether you would or would not submit to the powers which threaten to rob you of your very self your inner freedom to determine whether or not we will become the plaything to circumstance and renounce our freedom and our dignity. You see, circumstances around us are changing, but you and I, by God's grace and God's power and God's strength, still have the opportunity to choose every single day. We can choose, for example, to get real busy and, and to pretend that we are God, that we are in control. Things get out of control in our life or circumstances begin to crowd around us and I, I just push harder on the busy button. I just fill up my calendar more. I choose one more thing to do. I can choose to ignore it. I can choose to put my head down and be overwhelmed. Or I can choose to be still and know that God wants to be at work in me and through me and in us and through us as a church, even in a challenging season. 
I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Psalm chapter 46. Psalm 46 is where we're headed today, and we're going to spend a few minutes looking at our God, steadfast, immovable. We are in the second week of a series on, on looking at who God is in the midst of all the challenges and all the changes around us in our culture today. We can count on our God's steadfast, immovable. So look at Psalm 46. Let's read that together. And I'm going to read it in the NIV. Psalm 46, verse 1 says this, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake, with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see, the psalmist says, what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. What a great psalm. What a great psalm and what a great reminder that our God, immovable and steady. I, I love the first thing that we learn about God in this psalm. Our God, he is present and he is proven. There are three characteristics of God in the, in the first verse of the psalm. God is our refuge. He is our strength and he is our ever, ever present. He is ever present in the midst of our trouble. This is so important when you consider the context of what's going on in Psalm 46. When we open our Bibles, we look at Psalm 46, but we've got to stop and ask ourselves, what, what was happening in the midst here? What's the context? And the context of, of Psalm 46 is that Jerusalem and, and Israel, they were in the middle of being attacked by the Assyrian army. The, the Assyrians had gathered around the city and it was their desire to, to take siege and to lay hold of the city. To conquer the people that were inside. And the psalmist is writing about God who is present and proven. In the midst of a terrible circumstances. I'm sure something that was terrifying and frightening. A point where they're thinking are we even going to make it through this day. This week will we lose our lives to the Assyrians. The psalmist says hey I want you to know that God is our refuge. He is our strength. He is our ever present God in the midst of our trouble. The word trouble here describes people in a tight place, literally in a corner and unable to get out. And when that, that occurs, what, what's the admonition of the verse? The verse says, you know what? In the midst of that, don't be afraid. Fear sometimes is our first reaction when trouble comes our way. When, when we find ourselves in a tight spot, we find ourselves in a corner, we find ourselves in a moment where we're not sure where, how we're going to get out of that. Fear can grip our hearts, grip our lives. We can choose fear in that moment. And the psalmist says, do not be afraid. You see, I, I, looking at this and, and thinking about even Isaiah. In, in Isaiah chapter 37, verses 6 and 7, Isaiah says, say this to your master. Thus says the Lord, do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard, with which the, the young men of the king of Assyria who has blasphemed me, behold, I will put a spirit in him. He will hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword of the land. God is saying to the Israelites, hey, I see you. Do not be afraid. I know what the king of Assyria is saying. I know that he's putting out his word. I know that he's blaspheming me. I know he's threatening you in the land. But I am the God who is present and proven. I love that the psalmist says here that God is our ever-present help in the midst of our trouble. He did not say, follow God and you will not have any trouble. 
This is one of the great truths of scriptures. One of the great theologies that we have to spend more time thinking about and embracing. That following God does not mean that I'm not going to have trouble or difficulty in my life. And there are people walking around in our culture, our nation, and the world today who would say to you that if you follow Jesus and you give him your life, then you won't have any trouble. The only problem with that is the Bible. That's not what the Bible teaches. No, God says here, I'm an ever-present help in the midst of your trouble. God is with us, just like he was with Moses. Think about the story of Moses. God hears the cry of the Israelites who were in captivity. And God calls Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. Moses hits the panic button and says, what if they don't believe me? I don't think I can do it. I'm not sure I'm the right leader. And God says to him, I am and will be with you. Think about the call of Gideon. Again, the Israelites find themselves in a difficult season. They've turned their back on God. And they're worshiping Baal. And God calls Gideon and says, Gideon, I want you to be the leader who returns Israel to me. And Gideon starts with all of the reasons he can't do it. He even tests God with the fleece, right? Remember that story. God, prove yourself to me. And God says to Gideon repeatedly, I am and will be with you. Think about the birth of Jesus. We're getting ready to celebrate that here in just a handful of weeks. And we'll read in scripture again during the Christmas season that they were to call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The very incarnation of Jesus reminds us that God is with us. When trouble comes, and it does come regularly in our lives, I wonder where you turn. I wonder where I turn. See, the temptation is to turn inward, right? To say, I'm going to try and solve my own issues. I'm going to try and, and work hard enough and be smart enough and efficient enough. I'm going to persevere and get through these troubles. And there's something to be said for perseverance for sure. But the scripture reminds us here in Psalm 46 not to turn inward, but to turn outward to God. To even admit in our prayers and honesty to God, this time is difficult that I'm in. This season is challenging. But I don't want to try and figure it out on my own. I don't want to just be smart enough or self-sufficient enough. I want to turn to you, God, because you are present and you are proven. You're here. You're present and you're proven. Look what verse 7 of Psalm 46 says. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Notice that the psalmist ties God to history. The psalmist challenges the Israelites to turn back in their history and to remember the faithfulness of God. Not only is he present, but he is proven. He is proven. The psalmist is challenging them to think about times like when God led them through the Red Sea. You remember when you stood on, on the land and you looked out and you saw no way through the sea and God parted that for you. We'll remember when God led you through the wilderness into the promised land. We'll remember when God provided for you food, manna, and quail, victory over your enemies. I wonder how many times you and I stop and, and just consider how many times God has shown up in our hearts and our lives. How many times has God rescued you, rescued me from a difficult situation that we couldn't see our way out of? That time of family crisis in our marriage. A challenging time with our children. Maybe that season when I was out of work or struggling to pay my bills. That time of loneliness or difficulty. A season of temptation or even giving in where I shouldn't have. And God shows up with grace and mercy and forgiveness. His provision. The psalmist says to us in the midst of a challenging time all around us, God is present and God is proven. He is our refuge and our strength. Therefore, do not fear. You see, the truth for us, even in these challenging times, is that we have a choice, don't we? We have the choice to choose fear or to choose faith. And the Bible and, and, and Psalm 46 challenges us to remember that our God is present and proven. And, and that we will want to choose faith, not fear. 
It's in those moments of fear. When Paul wrote, hey, in everything, with prayer and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace that passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. He said, it's okay to be afraid. Just don't give in to it. It's okay to reach the edge of fear and say, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. But God, I want to trust in you. I want to remember that you are the God who is present and you are proven. I want to stop and reflect back on the history of your faithfulness, God. And I want to count on that same faithfulness in today's day and age, in the midst of my challenges. God, you are present. You are proven. You are my refuge. You are my strength. You are ever present in the midst of whatever I'm going through right now. That's who you are, God, and that's who I want to embrace. But not only is he present and proven, but God is the source of our power as well. Look at verse 4 of Psalm 46. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. God was to be the source of their strength. You see, again, think about the context. Jerusalem was one of the few cities in antiquity not built on a river. You see, water is life, isn't it? And so a lot of cities built in antiquity, they would build their city right where a river was. And most of the cities had walls around them, and that river would flow underneath the wall. Because wherever those people were living, they needed water. But Jerusalem was different. You see, that's a double-edged sword to have water flowing under the walls of your city. The good news is it brings water. It brings the source of life. But the challenge is when an army comes to attack that city, one of the first things they're going to do is they're going to stop that water. They're going to put a, a, a shelter or a dam in there that stops water. And not only are they attacking you, but they're taking away your ability to drink and to nourish your body. Jerusalem was different. When Hezekiah built the city of Jerusalem, he built a system of water tunnels into the city from the Kidron Valley. There was a secure water supply in the event of a siege. This is amazing. Hezekiah realized, you know what? We will be attacked. There will be challenges outside our wall. But instead of being able to cut off our water source, no, our water source is going to come from within the city through an intricate system of delivery. Hezekiah thought that through with the wisdom of God so that when we are besieged, when we are attacked, and we will be, they will not be able to cut off our water source. And now the psalmist here is using that as a metaphor, equating water with God. The same way he says here, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy place where the Most High dwells, God is within her. God will help her. Hezekiah was saying, as he built the city, and the psalmist is saying, as we're reading here in Psalm 46, the same way that that water source is secure, God is secure. God is the source of our power. Later on, Jesus would say very similar words in John chapter 7, when he was talking about the power of God that would be flowing through our lives and into our lives. You see, Jesus knew the same thing the psalmist did. There's going to be chaos at times around us. There's going to be times when it feels like people are attacking our walls, trying to take over our city, take over our lives and our culture. But God says, you know what? The source of my power is to come from within you. A lot of times we look outside of ourselves for that power, don't we? When our bank accounts are full, we feel great. When, when life is going well, we feel great. When we're healthy and strong, we feel great. And we try to grab onto exterior things to, to give us that power. And God says, no, no, that power should come from me and it should come from within. In John chapter 7, verses 37, it says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of him, his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said to talk about the Spirit whom those who had believed were to receive. Because Jesus was talking about the Spirit of God. You see, the power of God, one of the things available to us is the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit, whose job is to remind us of the words of Jesus, to convict us, to encourage us. Literally, though, our walls can be attacked from outside of us. Our lives inside are secure because of the Spirit. But not only His Spirit, but God's power is available to us through His Word. 2 Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for godly life through our knowledge of Him. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the servant of God, the man, the woman of God, you and me, might be thoroughly equipped in every good work. The power of God springing up inside of us comes from his spirit, comes from his word. It also comes through his church. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. You study the book of Acts and you see that as the early believers were following Jesus, the church was God's idea. The church was a place where, where men and women and families could go and they could reach up in worship to God. They could be encouraged through the word of God. They could fellowship with each other. But the church was also a place that they could reach out to their neighbors, to their cities, their towns, so much so that they were challenged to go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. The church was a place and is a place where we grow in our faith. We worship God and we're sent out to see the kingdom of God grow all around us, sharing the good news of Jesus. Where is your power today? In the midst of all the challenges and changes we're facing, where are you looking for power? You see, we do have a choice, right? We can rely on our own power, or we can rely on the power of God. The same way Hezekiah built that city with the streams flowing from inside the city. God wants you and I to live our lives with his power through his word, through his spirit, and through the church flowing out of us from the inside out. That's why Jesus talks so much about our interior lives. That we're to guard our hearts. We're to pay attention to what we put into our life. We're out of it flow. Everything in in us and through us. Where are you looking for your power? Not only is God present. Not not only is, is he proven. Not only is he the source of power. But God, he's the one who gets the praise. Right? God is the one who gets the praise. The end of Psalm 46, an invitation to us. The psalmist says, come and see what the Lord has done. He has brought the earth under his power. He makes war cease. He breaks the bow. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Again, a really important thing for us to to learn from Scripture is that God is always at work. God is always bringing glory to his name. God's name will always be exalted because that's who he is. He is a God who brings glory to himself in the great times and in the hard times. Remember Romans 8, all things work together for good. To those who love God and are called according to his purposes. All of those things around us, even the chaos sometimes we see, we don't understand it, but God is at work for his glory and our good if we allow it. And so we stop and we say, hey, what has God done? What's he done in our lives? What's he done around us? We need to stop and reflect on that to come and see what the Lord has done. But in order to see what God is doing, we've got to slow down. We've got to stop. Something that we're not always great at. But God invites us here when he says, you know what? Be still and know that I am God. Be still. When I choose to be still, that's when God speaks to me. When I choose to be still, that's when God gives me perspective over my circumstances and my fear. When I choose to be still, God gives room and makes room to work in my heart. You see, the myth and the lie that sometimes I want to buy into is that God will show up in all of my activity. As I'm running every day and keeping my list and making my list and getting everything done. And saying, God, please show up. Please, please be present. 
And God says, slow down, be still, and know that I am God. There's a really challenging verse in Jeremiah chapter 6, where the Lord said to the people in Jeremiah, stand by the roads and look. Ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. God gives them an invitation through the prophet Jeremiah. Stop, look, ask, walk in it, and you'll find rest for your souls. But the end of that verse is the difficult part. It says, but the people said, we will not walk in it. The people heard the invitation from God to stop, to be still, to allow him to speak, to allow him to give perspective, to allow him to work in their hearts. But as they looked around, they decided, I think I'm gonna do something else. I'm gonna choose a different option than to be still before God. How many times do you and I choose a different option? Maybe it's social media, maybe it's time on my phone. Maybe it's one more ball game. Maybe it's a hobby. Maybe it's working a little bit more. I choose to fill up my life and fill up with activity in every moment of the day instead of being still before God. How are you doing? How am I doing at being still and knowing that he is God, experiencing that he is God? You see, our God is the one who gets the praise, and we have a choice in that. A choice to choose activity or a choice to, to be still. You see, every one of these moments comes down to a choice, the psalmist says. A choice to remember that God is present. A choice to remember that God is the source of power. A choice to choose being still instead of choosing constant activity. Psalm 46 is highly instructive to us on how to keep our balance in a highly volatile and shifting world. I mentioned Viktor Frankl earlier. I want to go back to another thing he said. Fascinating quote that I've been thinking about. Viktor Frankl said this, between stimulus and the response, between something that occurs and my response to it, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. You see, we are in shifting, changing, challenging times. And that stimulus is going to come our way every day this week. I want us to remember that you and I have a choice. We'll be presented with stimulus something that happens around us, and then we will respond to that. We'll either respond in faith or in fear, in trusting our own power or relying on God's power, on choosing busyness or choosing being still. And in that choice, God is going to be at work in us and through us, or we're going to choose to walk that path out of our own strength. Great quote from Victor Frankel, but even better is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 that says it this way. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight for his glory and your good. I want to challenge us this week to remember Psalm 46. Spend some time in Psalm 46 to remember that he is present and proven. He is powerful and he is and will get the praise. And he invites us into that. To trust him and to surrender our hearts and lives. And to remember that he is the God who's trustworthy, immovable. The God that we can count on. Maybe just a couple of questions for you to reflect on and even have a conversation with some people this week. Of how is your life going right now? What season are you in? And in past seasons, maybe like this, how have you seen God reflect on his faithfulness and his goodness? How about this week? How do you see God in his presence and the changing and shifting things of life? How are you slowing down to know that he is God? And who are the people that you're walking with? What are the action steps that even out of today's look at Psalm 46, 
that you can take to draw near to God in the midst of this season? And then how are you inviting others to pray for you, to walk with you in the midst of life right now? Our God, immovable, trustworthy, invites us to walk with him. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much that you are a trustworthy God. Thank you that you see us and you hear us and you invite us to walk deeper with you this week. Thank you that you've given us your spirit and your word and the church. Thank you that you are present and near. Lord, we want to choose to slow down and to be still and to see you in us and through us. And we'll do that to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.